Okay, so does anyone know the uh, the reference in the title there? There's a few heads old enough to pick that up. Yes? It's from the song, that's right. <laughs> so 400 miles from Darwin, it was a little song about, um, I guess, the conflict in East Timor and the closeness to Australia, but our complete indifference at the time to that. Um, so uh, I guess that kind of captures some of what, what I'm going on here uh, about here with the, you know, they're close. But I mentioned it last night, it's actually 401 miles, so the Whitlam's were pretty slap, on, slap bang on the, on the money with their distance. Um, but a completely different world. Um, and uh, some issues I think we can uh, get our teeth into and really help out with um, if we get past some of the political issues at play. Okay, so... Uh, putting some acknowledgements up front, the work has been funded by AusAid um, in very close collaboration with uh, departments within the government in East Timor. Um, some uh, very good NGO collaboration, particularly from a group named called Roman Luan, and also funded by the Australian uh, Centre for International Agricultural Research, who, who funds a lot of our work in the Pacific and, and into Asia as well. And uh, some of my team, uh, valuable team there, um, okay, so who are we? Some of you um, have been to one of mine or Pips or Jess's seminars before and might know some of this, but I'll just flick quickly through who we are and what we're doing here. So Worldfish is part of the CGIAR, which is the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, which is a fairly huge organisation, but broken down into 15 research centres. Um, some 10,000 scientists working across 120 countries with a, a very... Um, focused uh, research objective around food security, so working in developing countries. Um, Worldfish is a tiny slice of this. We're one of the smaller centres. Uh, 210 research staff. Um, 2.5 of us sit at JCU here in the centre. So there's myself and Pip Cowan and half of Jess. Um, possibly another half coming online soon, which might... Make Jess feel a bit more complete. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we have a MOU with, with the Centre of Excellence, um, particularly around the areas of um, coastal system resilience is, is kind of the collaborative area. So there's, there's connections on governance, uh, connections on uh, social ecological systems, I guess. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, have, we work across most of the developing world except for the American space. Um, which is just a historical artefact. Um, we work on sustain sustainability um, and food security issues and poverty, so broken up into a different uh, group of headlines there. Climate change, improved value chains, so marketing systems, nutrition and health, gender, which is whenever you're talking food security, <coughs> it has to be a massive uh, component. Sustainable aquaculture technologies and policies and practice for resilience. And most of our small scale fisheries work comes under that last one, around coastal systems resilience. So, before I launch into East Timor, I want to have a bit of a look at the fisheries and food security side of things. Um, we often here get uh, presentations which are directed more around um, conservation um, and the, the role that. The, I guess the conservation approach to marine resources now obviously very tightly um, tied up to food security, but we come from a slightly different angle here. Um, so how do coastal fisheries feed into food security? Uh, three main ways, through fish consumption, so direct food security, through household income and through economic growth at the, at the larger level. So fish supply 4.3 pe billion people with 15 to 20% of their um, require with 50, 15 to 20 percent of their animal protein intake. Now, uh, it, it's hard to sort of synthesise sensible figures around that. Certainly in the Pacific, it's up to 60 percent and beyond in many countries. Um, but that's kind of a, a, a bit of a wash across the, everything. Um, as within that animal protein, there's more specifically the the micronutrient levels in fish um, are particularly valuable in the food security arena. So. Um, very much unquantified and it's something Worldfish is working on at the moment to at least be a, a, another area where we can sort of push the profile of fish in food security. So household income, um, around 120 million direct jobs and that's including full-time and part-time workers, it's not including people who are just seasonal and occasional fishers. 
um, so that's sort of employed uh, workers, uh, supporting 520 million livelihoods. So that's a much broader take on sort of the flow on effects of, of who's working on boat building, who's working on transport systems and so on. Of course, rough figures, but uh, the actual economic value, traded value of around $100 billion. Um, now, if you want to take that through to actual uh, realised value, there's a lot of equations about subsidies and uh, people coming up with negative estimates for actual value and, and things like that. So total value is hard to put a, a finger on, but certainly in terms of um, contribution uh, in developing countries, it's, it's a very hard thing to quantify because the numbers are just, you, you just can't get your hands on it. We're going to talk largely about the top two um, fish consumption and household income and their role in this Timor. Um, just a, a, a slightly more detailed look at this. This is some work I did with the World Bank and um, FAO trying to bring some of these numbers together and just highlighting there for the small scale fisheries in the developing world, around about 100 million people uh, of a total of 117 million. Uh, that's in the developing world. If you want to bring the developed world in there, it only jumps to about 120 million. So the huge majority of fishers are in the developing world. And 47% of that fisheries workforce is women. So there's a massive gender component in here. Um, it needs a lot of teasing apart, so there may be sort of menial work in there that isn't of particular value, but there's certainly um, real potential for improving food security at household level through that um, engagement of women in fisheries. Um, superfood is something we hear time and time again. Um, I guess in the context of uh, supply of uh, food security to the most needy, uh, fish has, has a lot going for it. Um, so some of the people often talk about animal protein, but it goes well beyond that. Um, so here we have a look at calcium, iron, zinc, and vitamin A, um, all um, considerable components of fish intake. Now, um, that directly keys into some of the major hunger issues globally. So some 2 billion people suffer from hidden hunger, which is micronutrient deficiency. So um, fish can key strongly into that. Um, and 1 million children under 5 die due to vitamin A and zinc deficiencies. Again, we saw that, that was um, fish can really help out in that area. Um, a lot of uh, there's fatty acids and a range of other components of fish which can all help out with childhood development. So uh, really critical in the food security story. Um, People don't really recognise the level of fish production globally either. So if you look at this, it's looking at uh, across cattle, chicken, pig, sheep and fish, and fish is the top line there. So well and truly trumping the others, and two to three times um, cattle and, and pig production. Um, this is uh, from a paper by Chris Benet, which has just come out in Food Security. Um, it's it's a really interesting read, bringing some of this stuff together. So, flipping across to East Timor. Um, so, as we said, 400 miles from Darwin. Uh, East Timor is uh, come to bringing itself out of a lot of political turmoil. So, the newest nation in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, 2002, they officially, officially became an independent nation. Um, tracking back from that, they were under Indonesian occupation from, since 1975, nine days after the Portuguese left. So the Indonesians invaded right on the tail of the, of the departure of the Portuguese. Um, Portuguese have been there since the 1600s and slowly lost interest in the place, I think. Um, Indonesia was particularly interested because of the oil resources there, and Australia, likewise, has been particularly interested because of the oil resources. Um, a little quirk is that East Timor is actually the half of the island here, so this is West Timor, which is Indonesia, plus this is long claim here, um, Akusi, which is the area where the Portuguese first landed, so it has a lot of historical significance to them. Uh, as we go through today, I'll be talking in particular about two areas, Ataro Island, uh, which is, if you bring the rest of Indonesia into that, it's very much in the Indonesian archipelago, but again, has a lot of historical significance to East Timor. And Batigade, right on the border, um, the, the district includes Balbo, which again has quite a high profile because of the Balbo Five and the, the uh, initial Indonesian invasion from there. So. Okay, so a snapshot of Timor Leste. Uh, 
<clears throat> 1 to 1.2 million people, so quite a small country. Uh, they lost 200,000, 100 to 200,000 people. There's a lot of different estimates around that through the conflict. Um, significant proportion of that through direct consequence of the con conflict, but a higher proportion through starvation as an indirect con consequence of the, of the conflict. 41% um, of the population now below the poverty line. So pretty, pretty scary uh, situation, so close to our borders. 80% uh, of the GDP now is petroleum based. So the fight um, by them for the petroleum resources is, is life and death. You know, that's, that's where they get their income from. Uh, GDP per capita is around 6,800 at the moment, but if you take oil out of that, you're looking at 850, which is obviously very small. Um, and the public service wage is in the order of $450 a month, just to give you a bit of an indicator there. 65% of the population works in the agricultural sector, which is only 2.6% of GDP. So a lot of them are missing out on the trickle dip, supposed trickle down from oil wealth and so on. Coffee is the next largest export and it doesn't really register in the percentage. Um, so it's, it's quite tiny, but happily growing. Um, East Timor is, uh, has extreme bathymetry, particularly on its north coast. Now, in terms of fisheries, by far the majority of the fisheries occur on the north coast. Um, this sort of southern area is very sparsely populated. There's a fair bit of illegal Indonesian fishing ha ha happening through that zone. Um, but not a lot of local fishing. Um, between, has, has this got a functioning point? Ah, okay, so between Ataro Island, one of our sites here, there's about a 20k stretch there, and that's about three kilometres deep. So, um, really extreme bathymetry on this, on the north coast there. Um, you know, the politics around oil, um, Australia has extended its. Um, it's, it's uh, economic zone to very close to East Timor based on that being their continental shelf and supposedly a subduction zone that occurs in there. As it turns out, the subduction, subduction zone is actually over here, so either we've got to try and claim East Timor <laughs> or we should back off a bit. Um, uh, so, yeah, th th there's ongoing conflict around that at the moment. Um, and, of course, along with this, uh, the oil... Uh, that comes in there is the resource curse, which you can see played out in places like Nigeria, particularly, for example, which is rich in oil, but extreme in poverty. Um, East Timor is doing a fantastic job of avoiding that. So uh, Norway, in particular, has worked really closely with them to build a sovereign wealth fund, which uh, is meaning they're not flooding their country with money, uh, which then drives up inflation rates and makes life pretty hard. But that's a really interesting line to work when you have, walk when you have so many people in poverty. So they're really struggling with that issue of keeping a wealth fund for the future. They've only got 20 year horizon on the oil production. Um, so how are they gonna uh, cope with that? It's, it's a tough line to walk. Uh, and they're, they're having a, a legitimate try at, at it. Um, now, part of the conflict with Australia as well, you may have heard uh, around microphones being built into the walls of parliament when they, uh, when Australian contractors worked in East Timor and uh, sort of listening in on the conversations around oil wealth and allegedly passing some of that information onto Woodside Petroleum as part of the negotiation there. So that's uh, there's some, some pretty uh, unusual stuff going on there. Uh, okay, so fish and food security in Timor Leste. It's not a fish. <laughs> Um, pigs are more important than fish. Pigs are more important for a number of reasons. Um, so, 80% of protein intake in East Timor is eaten during festivals. So they don't eat a lot of meat, um, but pigs, goats, cattle are really important in that process. Fish aren't. There's pluses and minuses of, of that, in that they kind of sit outside of some of the cultural norms. So. Um, the potential to increase fish consumption outside of that is something we have to be um, very aware of. Uh, another important role for pigs, uh, and you can see this little babe has been snuffling around in the beach there, is the crocodile bait. So, so there's a huge number of crocodiles around East Timor. The, the greatest number of fisheries accidents are due to crocodiles attacking boats. Um, and so the pigs are a bit of a, a constant diet for the crocodiles as they snuffle around in the, 
in the sand there. So they're, they're, uh, they're good for the fishing communities for that reason as well. Um, so fisheries are important for food security in terms of their potential, no, not so much in terms of their importance now. Um, so current fish consumption is very low, which is really surprising for an island nation. Six kilograms per capita per year, um, compared with a global average, I think, of 17 now, and an Asian average of around 27. So um, very low, and there's a, there's a number of reasons behind that. Um, chronic childhood malnutrition uh, is, a, is an issue. So 48% of children, which is the highest, highest rate in the world, are stunted which means they're not growing properly and they have bone um, malformation because of it. So, again, fish have real potential to feed into that. The consumption rate varies massively from coastal areas to inland. So the, the, the movement or trade of fish inland just isn't really happening. So, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the fisheries needs team orders, around 4,000 boats, 90% are very small, 95% are very small, so they're dugouts, they're fiberglass, um, less than half of them have outboard motors. There's a colonial history of much larger, well, larger vessels fishing. So as the Indonesians left, they had this scorched earth policy where they damaged most of the infrastructure, burned a lot of boats, all the wharves and jetties, aquaculture infrastructure were all destroyed. Um, so the Indonesians were fishing there for a while, the Portuguese before that, it was one of the resources they, they um, enjoyed there. So there's not a tradition of offshore fishing at all amongst these Timorese. Uh, very much mixed livelihoods. Uh, so they're farmer fishers. You find very few people who are full-time fishers. And it's viewed as an underperforming sector. So questions around how, how it could uh, be upscaled, if you like, which, of course, rings immediate alarm bells in terms of sustainability, um, but is, is a really important question. So... Fisheries currently are in a low production, high value modality. And anyone in the room who is, is more from the conservation angle uh, would, would look at that and say, fantastic, that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> you know, this, this is where we want to move fisheries, generally. Um, in a country where you have such chronic food insecurity, where you have a lot of landless people, where you have um, people disconnected from the from the uh, larger economy, uh, you've got to question that. So this is kind of the, the interesting line we're working, walking in developing uh, the fisheries with East Timor. Um, starting from very much a blank slate, so there's not much in the way of policy, there's not much in the way of direction, and the question is where do we take it? It's, it's pretty exciting to be sort of in at that grassroots level and contributing to that, but there's a lot of questions to be asked around that. So the overarching sort of question we're asking in our presence there is can, coastal, can the coastal fisheries sector contribute in a substantive way to improved food and nutrition security in Timor Leste? Now to do that it has to be sustainable. So there's no, there's no sort of divorcing that from sustainability issues at all. But um, the focus of our work again is towards food security. So I want to take you through a little bit of the scoping we've done there. Um, in terms of contributing more to fisheries there's certain criteria you would need to meet. And, and one of them is the capacity to integrate with, with a larger economy. So where fisheries are simply, where, where there's subsistence fisheries, where fishers are acting uh, out of day-to-day -day drivers, the ability to engage at that level is a long way off. So we had, we had a range of questions around how fishers are engaging with the economy and, uh, and how we can uh, look at that in terms of greater contribution to, to food security. There, one of the other things about East Timor in terms of uh, history is that there are very few historic records left. So again, government infrastructure and records are trash. So there's no historic fishing data to deal with. There's nothing, nothing uh, before independence. So we have to scratch around for the indicators we can find in, in the data that's there since then. Um, so looking at crop production, um, just in terms of food security issues, you can see very much a tendency to be upland, inland. East Timor is very hilly, and so these red areas here are very much inland areas. Um, sorry, that shouldn't say boat ownership, that should say crop production. This is boat ownership. <laughs> um, so, yeah, coast, very much coastal, very much away from those areas of crop production. Now, you would say that doesn't really speak to what I said before about mixed livelihoods. 
but it's all about degrees. So pretty much every fisher is farming, um, but not every farmer is fishing because they don't have access to the coast. Um, so um, look, looking again at using the data we could get our hands on and looking at in capacity to engage with the broader economy, um, we looked at uh, developing a range of indices, taking in the sort of resilience angle and so on, but in the end, uh, we kind of had to do something very tailored to the information available, which was a combination of compound and simple indicators. So the, um, the simple indicators you can see along here. Now, female-headed households, that, that feeds in as a negative, um, having lost close to 200,000, mostly men in the conflict. There's, there's a female-headed households, are, are, you know, there's, there's a surprising number in some places. Um, Compound indicators around education, around um, production systems and livelihoods, and around sort of style of life there. Um, so this was developed uh, in collaboration with, with some of the, the guys working in government there and looking at what we had available and what they thought was important. And what we get out of that is this. So surprisingly, uh, you know, there, there's a narrative that's played out about fishers being the poorest of the poor and um, accessing you know, the, the open access um, fisheries because there's nothing left. What we in fact found is quite a high correlation between, again, I shouldn't have the boat ownership there, that's the strength index, and that's boat ownership. So again, just flicking between the two, the correlation, except for a couple of areas, um, up here in particular, but these are low data areas, um, is very low. So, uh, sorry, the correlation is very high. So, in fact, our fishers in East Timor aren't the poorest of the poor. Um, probing that a bit further, there's, there's a good number which are, in fact, the majority that are connected with the economy on a sporadic basis. So, one of the issues they have is consistency of supply in developing markets, um, but th there is a level of integration with um, national markets in most cases. Just uh, sort of a last look at the data we could, that was available on fisheries. The FAO have been there um, recently and, and created a national fisheries database system. It's fallen over again since they left, um, and we're sort of picking it up again in the near future. But um, this is just over the couple of, or year and a half that it was functioning. Uh, this is a total output. We, we spent a lot of time working with the people who entered the data and a range of things to, to, to get this data out. Um, Interestingly, very much dominated by pelagic fish, not league fish. 90% um, in those top four groupings. Um, now, I have a lot of questions around the bias in this. I think it's biased heavily towards the fishers who are catching a lot. Um, and once we talk to the, to, at the community level, the reef, fish, reef fisheries come out as more important, relatively more important for food security issues. So... Um, that's what we've got to work with. Um, it does show a predominance of, of pelagic fisheries at the moment, um, but, but it's not the full story. So, data poor situation there. Um, talking to communities is by far a better way of getting really uh, good data on what's going on. That has certain challenges in East Timor as well. So this is one of our early data collection trips. Um, sitting right there is one of these at about four and a half metres long. He's just, just off the coast there. Um, my research assistant at that time was completely petrified and spent the whole meeting looking over his shoulder watching this guy. Um, about there is a headstone of a guy who was eaten the week before by that crocodile. So the pigs haven't been entirely doing their job. Uh, so, um, yeah, crocodiles is a big issue. I, I guess uh, crocodiles have a... The East Timorese have an interesting relationship with crocodiles. They won't touch them um, because they, they believe they rode to East Timor on the back of crocodiles and there's an ancestral relationship there. So it's actually good luck. They believe they've got crocodiles in the communities. It stops them fishing. It's closed down aquaculture. It's done a range of other things. Um, intriguingly, they kept that belief. Um, I've, I've had conversations around forests and they said, oh, life got much easier once uh, Christianity came because it released us of our beliefs in the sacred nature of the forest. So we could use the forest. They're now suffering from chronic deforestation. For some reason, they didn't drop the beliefs. <laughs> if we could flip that, we may be a little better off. But, but anyway, um, 
So that's, yeah. Uh, scoping the main fishery. So talking to, it obviously varies must massively across sites, but um, there's a very diverse reef fishery. So these guys here are fishing, this is, this is a typical small boat size. You can't quite see it here, but there's a spear gun in the back, there's a gill net in there. So it's very mixed mode. Um, these guys are, are, are fish scarers, effectively, so they've set a net on the reef and then scare everything out into it. Um, vacuum cleaners, pretty much. Low selectivity, low capital investment, um, high and low value catch, so high value component is getting less and less, and a very limited area of reefs. So this extreme bathymetry we talked about earlier means that the coastal fringing reef is tiny. So as the population grows, it's getting more and more uh, stressed out. Uh, so that's, that's a major issue for, for governance. There's also a non-boat component of this, of, of the reef fishery, um, gleaned by women, but also trap fishing, spear fishing directly off the, off the rocks. Um, that's, again, fairly unquantified, and it's something we're working on at the moment. The sardine fishery is a fas fascinating one. It's, a, as you can see, a very small mesh monofilament uh, fishery, and you have the con some of the conservation NGOs who've sort of got there before us have been selling a line about closing down small mesh fisheries. Um, this is a seasonal fishery that's highly selective, um, has a low capital investment, is highly nutritious, and provides fish that are very affordable to the communities. It's fish that's not eaten in Dili, so it doesn't get the high price from the middle class buying in Dili, and so it's one of the most important fisheries in the country, as far as I can see. Um, closing it down would be a complete disaster. Uh, its sustainability is, is something we're going to start. We're starting to look into soon. It's, it's very much a seasonal fishery, which goes around the um, the wet season. So the water flow from rivers um, is critical for the sardine fishery, and um, so there's issues about uh, the future of that given changing rainfall patterns. The ringnet fishery is stepping up a scale. So that's that's a first sight fishery. Um, again, you can see this guy here with his goggles on, they use scarabs and, and guys to swim the net around. Again, with the high currents that run around there, you can't just set a net from a boat or it'll completely collapse. So it's quite a, it's quite a complex operation. Catches the mid-sized pelagics, these guys are the long toms. Um, there's a high labour component, so a lot of crew required. Very selective because they're targeting schools again. Fairly high capital, so it's not particularly accessible to the poorest fishers and uh, generates moderately affordable fish. So some will go into the dilly markets and some will remain in communities. Again, sustainability is a question. Further, um, more scoping in the communities. This is uh, around seasonal patterns of livelihoods and food security. So um, with the livelihood structures there, we'd be pretty silly just to concentrate on fish because it's all integral. So this is actually looking at um, how the importance of various crops and fish change throughout the year in this case working with a women's group um, to look at their activities. Um, this is what comes out of it. I don't expect you to be able to interpret that. Um, but in this particular case, um, one, one thing I'll highlight is that there's a... In fact, in every village, there's a hungry season. They happen at different times of year, and it's very much dependent on the mix of livelihoods. So around February um, into January and March here, the hungry season relates to storms. Um, it relates to heavy labour as well, so they're planting out at this time of year um, and they can't get enough food. And often the crops have run out from the previous season if they haven't had a good season. Um, so if we're talking about food security, it would be sensible to look at potentially fisheries that could fill a gap there if, we can, if there is such a thing, um, or put, putting efforts elsewhere perhaps into the crop side of it um, because... You know, different crops may be able to fill that gap as well. Um, coping mechanisms for that are selling livestock, which is a huge step. You know, livestock aren't a particularly liquid asset. You can't sell a cow's leg or something. You know, if, you, if you own a couple of cows, selling off a cow is a huge hit to your, um, to, to your personal assets. Um, and moving to government labour is another thing. So the government will put on these $3 a day labour activities of building roads and so on that people will shift into. Um, so, uh, more of the scoping work. So, talking about um, adaptations that would move this forward, we worked with communities on uh, some participatory 
uh, network scope. Now, often you see this used in terms of sort of a, a complex analysis. Um, what we're doing here is simply saying, who do you talk to now, and who would you need to talk to in order to implement certain changes in the way you do things? So you can see these guys are stacking up uh, rocks on various um, players. So they put the, the players on the cards. They're stacking up rocks to signify the importance of that connection or the strength of that connection. Um, and so this becomes really important in the next steps of, of implementing change. This one is, is more looking at the priorities of the community. So working with the men's and women's groups separately, we brought out uh, a range of priorities for adaptations that they saw. We then brought them together. Everyone gets a stone and the priorities are listed and they get to stick their stones next to where their priorities are on that. Um, and the output is this. Again, don't try and read the left-hand diagram. It's just sort of output from our analysis. Um, an example here around the fisheries resources. Um, so in the community we were just in before, um, limited skills. You might often hear a fisherman say he's got limited skills. You know, they, they sort of they're, they're really into their um, livelihood, and are, you know, you, you normally wouldn't walk up and expect to to learn more than the fisherman knows in a hurry. Um, as, as I said, these guys have very much mixed livelihood. They've come from a tradition which has been dominated by colonial um, influences, and they, they are really only skilled in a few areas of fishing. So um, there are questions around that. Um, unpredictability of a rainy season was a big one that came up, so changing patterns of rain uh, affecting the fisheries, and just lack of infrastructure. Um, ability to create ice and, and to access markets. Different thing here on the Taro Island, the offshore island there. Um, increasing pressure on the reefs, no alternative livelihoods. Fish earning high dollars, so they can easily get their fish to Dili. But because, because of that, the fish are quite expensive there, so it drags a lot of other people into that fishery. Um, out, so outsiders coming in is a problem. Low rainfall leads to low agricultural production, which leads to upland people switching to fishing. So again, a very strong climate change tie in there. Um, particularly unpredictability is a big one there. So if the rains start and fail, they'll plant crops and then they'll lose them and they'll go fishing. Um, so that creates conflict between the coastal dwellers and the upland dwellers. And the upland guys also tend to fish with poison because they're not as skilled. So they'll, they'll bring root poisons down from that they've been growing upland. And again, the fishers don't particularly like that. So working with the communities, we looked at um, adaptations across... Uh, fisheries and agriculture, that's the areas of importance for their livelihoods. Um, again, being this broader monster that we are in terms of the CGIAR, we can bring in people in the agricultural sector, and we also have some strong partners there in that area. So we don't um, sort of restrict ourselves to fisheries. Um, so looking at local laws, they have a uh, traditional system they call Tarabondu, which is, is the system they have used traditionally to manage natural resources. Uh, it hasn't been used in a lot of places on um, marine resources, but they're certainly open to that, and they see the need to bring in some system of management for coral resources, um, and also having better access to pelagic fisheries. A lot of questions we need to answer around that one. Agriculture, it's about improved water collection, and it's about knowledge around different crops and around um, different forms of agriculture. So moving on, that was, I guess, a discrete element that was funded um, through AusAid. Um, and often these projects stop there. You get to the working with communities to plan climate change adaptation or livelihood adaptation, and that's what the project was. Um, we managed to move this on beyond that. So we have the money now for implementation phases, so looking at the adaptations that the communities highlighted and moving on to implementation. I'll, I'll, I need to get the skates on, so I'll, I'll skip through this reasonably quickly. Um, so fish aggregating devices. Again, um, conservation NGOs will throw up their hands and say we need to get rid of them. There's a lot of confusion between offshore industrial fans and nearshore um, artisanal fans. So um, these fads are small, are placed close to the coast, but not close to reefs, and attract, attract largely small pelagic fish. So very few tuna, very few of the sailfish and so on. And they're not targeting them here anyway. They're looking for schools of high productivity mackerel and, and um, 
small, small scads and, and other small fish. Um, so this is, this is the more traditional, what they call the rompun, which is a, a bamboo raft that they make and, and deploy off the coast. Um, this is what's been creeping in from Indonesia, um, and that's yeah, d just an adaptation which tends to survive better in heavy current situations. Now, in terms of working with them to look at fan systems, there's challenges in both those sites. So in Ataro, there's extreme bathymetry and there's extreme currents. In Bat Batagada, there's cross-border interaction. So this is much more social. Um, what they've had before, they, they set one up in the early 2000s and the Indonesians came across and fished with them. They got a lot of fish and the Indonesian citizen is great and took it. <laughs> well, that's their story. Um, and so, so they lost their fish. And uh, these guys, a lot of them married across the border as well. Um, the border is obviously only a recent thing, so uh, it creates a lot of family conflict. And they, originally we went there, they said, we don't want fans, which would make a conflict. Um, issues with trade as well. So they get flooded with fish when they successfully fish a fad, which then they don't have the roots to trade, and so the price goes down, fish spoil, things like that. So... Um, we, we met the microphone before, so I talked about how, how uh, it's alleged that Australia built microphones into the walls of um, Parliament House. Seems a bit obscure to bring back in here. Interestingly, when I sat down with a group of department guys and we talked about deploying fads in East Timor, they looked at me and they said, you're Australian, right? And I said, yes. They said, you're deploying devices in the ocean, right? And I said, mm, yes, but I said, should we be checking them for microphones? <laughs> uh, I said, I don't think it's really necessary. <laughs> um, so, yeah, creating some political uh, wrinkles there. So, working very close with the fishermen in the communities to uh, look at fads, look at how you would fish them productively, how you would fish them sustainably, and I guess put data systems in place that they can basically run, but can feed us um, good data on. <coughs> On, on what's being caught on fats. Um, working with the local guys, we're just installing a, an echo sounder on, on one of the local boats there. Um, this is one of the larger local boats, as you said. Um, and doing some pretty extensive surveying. So, as I said, one of the big issues is the symmetry. Um, this green is a, is a locally um, implemented marine protected area. And so, uh, the idea here is that if we can put fads close to, but offshore from the marine protected area, it gives the guys who would have been fishing there an alternative. Um, but you can see this hideously steep slope there. If you, if you sort of average that slope over a reasonable distance, it's about one to one. So 100 metres offshore, you're 100 metres deep. Kilometre offshore, you're a kilometre deep. Um, so pinpointing these sort of flatter areas, which are in range for small canoes, but potential areas to put fans, is something they can't do themselves, um, that we've been helping out with. Um, we've also had an extensive FAD program, inshore FAD program, in Solomon Islands, our team who work over there. So we're learning a lot from them about design, how to anchor things, and the best types of FADs to have in uh, different areas. So this is something they've, they've put together. Um, so uh, this is us constructing uh, that design of FAD with the local guys. So very interested in looking at the traditional FADs versus these FADs in terms of their catch in terms of their longevity, particularly in the high current, um, high wash areas that we're talking about. The one on the right here is a, is a subsurface fad, so they don't come to the surface, they can't be pinched, they're less likely to be damaged. Um, deploying from one of the local, that's a former tuna pole fishing boat from Indonesia. Um, fairly full on activity there. Um, so, We've got as far as deploying, we've deployed in Ataro Island uh, and unfortunately, um, despite our technology, despite our sounding and so on, we're still having problems. So we're seeing, we're seeing the traditional issue, the, the issues they've had. Um, we're now working with more design guys and a few other sort of people to bring in some more technical um, analysis of what we could do to, to make things better there. Um, I'm not going to put any more gear in the water to it, but it's sorted because you're feeling pretty guilty about it. Using some of that gear as it is, they did manage to salvage some of it, but uh, unfortunately, a bit of it's still out there. Um, so, the other area we're working on is local regulation of, um, of fishing areas. So, this is some scraping work with one of the communities there. They get pretty excited when you come with a with a Google Maps image of, of, 
you know, Google Earth image of their fishing grounds. So it's really good to talk to them about areas that are traditionally important, um, areas that might have local rules over them and where they fish, areas of, areas of conflict and so on as well. This is my um, faithful research assistant who, who would be completely lost without. Um, talking with women groups as well, Pip Cohen there working with me on that. Um, really important to have women working with women, um, and she's our translator in this case as well. And really interesting when you get the women to talk to report back to the men as well and see the differences that they talk about and, and the, the gender aspects of resource use there. Um, the first community we're working with on, they specifically do want to look at marine protected areas. Um, they you know, can be a very valuable tool in some instances. Um, and these guys are developing the, in their community these uh, accommodation huts. So they've got three of these built on the shore now and are looking at ways of bringing people in. They also have a really nice little wall reef just off the front of this. So we're looking at using the local uh, government systems to help them protect this, um, to help work with the local authorities um, island-wide to make sure people respect that. Um, we're early days yet, but um, moving along with that. So, so that group is cohesive, it's a small community and should be reasonably straightforward to work on these, these components with. Um, the other side of the island is a different matter. Um, community cohesion is a huge thing when you're working on this sort of thing. So um, we'll start small. Um, so looking forwards, we have a long-term engagement. So thanks for funding from New Zealand, both in New Zealand um, and Norway, but also from Australia to some degree and hopefully an increasing degree. Um, World Fish will be there for some 10 years. So if people are keen to find a hook into working there on reef fisheries in particular, we now, we now have an office there, we have staff, we'll have a boat soon, so it'd uh, be, be uh, really good to get some collaborations going. Uh, really strong political engagement, so our office is in the Ministry of Fisheries. Um, we've had funded some risky work around value chains, which is always hard to do, um, but Norway have come to the party and we're working with a local social enterprise NGO or a social enterprise model for fishing. Cooperatives have failed in the past, so it's, we're sort of looking elsewhere. Um, Increasing uh, capacity for participatory stock assessments. So we do need to know some fairly fundamental things, particularly about pelagic resources. Um, we, we can work with the communities on reef fish, but they can't tell us a lot about the, the uh, pelagics. Ongoing research on fads and sustainability. This is some really exciting stuff there about uh, mounting autonomous mortar beam sounders around fads and, and looking at visitation patterns and optimal use of, of fads. Um, Norwegians are working with us on that, uh, which is pretty exciting. And uh, a lot of capacity building work. So starting from a pretty low base with the ministry, but um, working with them on that. And, and building up our livelihoods focus. So through engagement with broader food security issues in the country and with partners along the agricultural side, we're sort of integrating that, those approaches. Thank you very much.